<clears throat> first of all, existing tools. Everyone knows that available upon request generally isn't. So that's going to go under uh, concerns and difficulties, perhaps. Um, okay, so we've got a lot of failed attempts at this that we should learn from. Um, BioSimGrid was an effort by Mark Sansom and uh, uh, John Essex to do a trajectory database. I remember him talking about it. How many people know BioSimGrid? Okay, yeah, so there's a lot of lessons to be... I'll put it under existing tools because there's a lesson there. Um, uh, so there are tools, like the torrents that were referred to earlier by uh, uh, Eric Lindahl. Uh, gene torrent is used extensively in sharing sequence data now because you can get parallel file transfers. So we have analysis tools, lots of great ones, MD trash, MD analysis, CPP trash, all the Gromax stuff, uh, CAT DCD, I think was another one. Uh, we have a generic data analysis tools, pandas, sci-fi, and friends. Um, we have uh, lots of other visualization tools like NGLU, which we heard about, Pymol, BMD. We have um, uh, existing repositories, so people have used Figshare, GitHub, OSF, Zenodo, and now we've heard about uh, GPCR MD. Um, and finally, there's uh, some great Chem Informatics toolkits that help us perceive what's in different things, so that's a problem I'll talk about in a moment. RE Kit, OpenAI Toolkit, OpenVable, and uh, CDK, for example. Alright, so those are the existing tools. Now, we were, didn't have anything on the left side because we thought we weren't prioritizing things that weren't important, but that's up for debate, obviously. Um, uh, so we thought there's possibilities of building either a coordinated or a distributed uh, uh, trajectory repository. And they have different difficulties or complexities. And I'm not sure if you'll agree. We think having a way to share trajectories is important. But we thought that coordinated would probably be more difficult than a distributed trajectory repository. But again, that's quite up for debate. Can you describe a little more what you mean by central versus distributed? So if you built uh, like BioSim grid, one giant uh, place where everybody stores all of their trajectory data in one place, that would be a central coordinated um, trajectory repository. A uh, distributed one would be maybe everybody runs a server at their site and store, has some local storage that backs up chunks of other people's data as well. Uh, and could easily be networked together like the whole um, uh, uh, pirate bay. Um, so a streaming trajectory library for a subset of trajectory data would also be of uh, high utility, we thought. Um, so sim a simple like Python thing where you could easily grab uh, slices of trajectories uh, from a remote site. Um, finding the trajectories you might want seems to be a really hard problem. Uh, so a trajectory search engine like Google, because you, you don't even know what we would be searching for exactly. We heard a little bit about from GPCRMD and some of the things that you could search for, but in general the problem is quite difficult. Um, <clears throat> if you uh, are wanting to compute specific properties, uh, this is also somewhat related to this, in that you might want to identify trajectories that are suitable for computing things like uh, order parameters or slow degrees of freedom. Um, Visualization tools are, in general, pretty important, but not super difficult to put together. Um, one very easy win that is very uh, not difficult, but highly important, would be instead of sharing the trajectories, why don't we just share the initial conditions so that you can generate the trajectory yourself? So that would be something that we could easily persuade people to do in terms of journal editors, um, and would be sort of a prerequisite. Finally. Um, if you're wanting to figure out what the trajectory you get from downloading to somewhere is actually containing, you have to know what biological and chemical components are inside of it. And that's actually um, not super difficult, but pretty high, highly important if you want to actually make sense of it. Analysis tools, again, also somewhere around here, just in general. Um, it would be really great if we had some sort of wonderful hybrid of MD trash and MD analysis that was just one tool that also had a streaming data API, and maybe that was of intermediate complexity. And finally, um, uh, it would, as we get more trajectory data, it becomes more and more important not to have to shift the trajectories to you to do any data analysis. But it's quite complex to actually analyze the trajectory data where it is in place by using compute that's local to it, uh, but that would probably be something that's important in the future. Okay, anyone wants to be done? Yeah, okay. Right. Okay, so I think we have some important things with existing tools, so I'll just start from there. 
So we have university infrastructures, very much underutilized at the moment. We also have uh, Zenodo, we have Fixture, GitHub, <coughs> now MD server, and just we got this paper which says Primal, but I don't know if it's Sun. Sun. So there's, there's a, a feature in, in Primal which you can say, all right, there's these five atoms in this configuration, and find <coughs> three PVD that has those five atoms in that configuration. <coughs> That this is the kind of querying that we'll probably want. Okay, and now with that, with these existing repositories, I'll actually uh, um, highlight one of the problems. I don't know if you have ever tried to search anything on Fixture or Zenodo. Uh, it's really super difficult to find. I actually try to find my own data <laughs> with all the keywords that I put inside, and it only works when after I put my full name. So if, I, if and we often don't know what we're actually looking for, right? So unless you really know specifically what you're looking for and the DOI of the data set, it's like it's a big data dump, and you might never find something useful, even though it exists there. So I think searchability, findability, is a really big problem. Um, it's important, and I'm not sure how difficult it is. It's not impossible, but it's not that easy as well. This searchability is directly linked to metadata, which is how we find things. So we have to have a, actually a really good description of data so we can find something. So that's also important and not that difficult, but again, we need to agree on data models, data descriptions, semantics, and all the other things that we want to, how do we want to describe uh, our data. That brings us to automation, because we don't want to describe every file and spend an hour trying to characterize what's in that file. And I would put it here, because it's not, uh, it's important, but we can also kind of work around it at the beginning. It's not impossible. Um, it could be a little bit just boring and uh, take some time to implement. This also brings us with automation. What is really important is also ease of use if we want to achieve mass adoption. Because if it's really hard to use, if you have to spend hours to share your data, nobody will use it because at the moment you don't really get rewarded for sharing your data. So it's a huge time sink. You don't get rewarded, nobody will share. So ease of use, I don't really know how to put it because that's a, a complicated thing. I think it's important and maybe a little bit difficult because it includes probably uh, the UX design which current scientific software doesn't support really. And that also I think what we, okay so the problems that we have I guess is distribution of efforts. So Jana was telling about GPC RMD. I also try to build data sharing platform uh, Biosyngrid was also an attempt to build data sharing platform in the, in the past. There were actually many more, but they all failed at some point because I think the, the problem is that, again, this is the, the current, the, this is the usual approach how it works. We say, oh, would it be wonderful so we, if we could share data? And we still said, yes, let's write a grant. So we get a grant, so I also got a grant to, to develop a tool which, which you can share data. Then you write a paper, which I haven't done, and that's it. And that's like the end of the story. You have some piece of software, uh, and then the piece of software gets, gets forgotten and becomes abandonware and then some, like in a few years time we repeat the cycle, someone else does it in some other country and it all fails. So this distribution of efforts where everyone is trying to do the same thing and everyone thinks that they are doing better than that other person who did it before, um, it's a huge waste of time and money. But how to coordinate people, it's really hard. Uh, Technology, though, it's not that hard. Technology is actually very important, but it's easy because it's there. Whether we want centralized, decentralized, everything is out there. It's about putting it together, but also putting it together in a way that we will maintain it and actually use it. So all the components are there. So we can choose. We can all dump on one centralized repository, or we can have a centralized peer-to-peer. -peer. I know for, for a fact that technology exists. Personally, I'm for decentralized solution because there is something that people often forget about uh, uh, sharing data, and that's data ownership. And I'll put licensing here. So that's also a very important thing because universities actually own your data, not really you, and you shouldn't put it in Google Drive or Dropbox or anywhere else which is like outside of legal jurisdiction of your country and your 
University. We all break these things because at least they are not really uh, strictly enforced. But maybe in the future, and especially now that we finally start to understand the value of the data and how much money some companies make just by having data, I think that would probably be a, a little bit more policed, let me put it that way. By having distributed solution, yeah? Is it all the way down there? Uh, no. I don't know where to put it, actually, because it's a... Uh, it's important. <laughs> Difficulty. I don't know. Like, they exist. It is important, but maybe. On the other side, all the funding agencies are pushing big time for open data. So yeah, I don't know where to put it. What maybe it's a concern, just like all of this box. Yeah. Let's put it somewhere in the like here, like it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, so it's, it's it's important, but it's often neglected because you know nobody will pass as lawyers. They are not really liked, and so on and so forth. But with distributed system, essentially what we have, like every university could have their own repository. So the, the data is stored locally, but what we need is an interface that will connect them all. And that's, again, that's very possible, not very difficult. And so for maybe if you kind of switch universities, you don't have to like learn how to use someone else's repository and like learn how what's the hierarchy and how you should log in. You should have like one interface and when you move to the next university, your data is easy to transfer, at least the, the interface is the same and you don't have to spend time <coughs> to learn a new tool to do exactly the same function. Which again brings us to interoperability, which is the favorite word. Now that is hard because it includes standards and we talked about it in the morning and we can't agree on anything. And the thing is with interoperability, we don't have to aim for a particular one standard. We can have many file formats or whatever we want, as long as they are able to talk to each other or being interconverted or whatever we need to do. It's about information exchange and making it efficient, but it's hard. So again, going back to distributed things, again, Torrent's excellent idea. If you don't know, there are also some really interesting tools called IPFS, which is Interplanetary File System, and that project, which also supports versioning and Torrent-like uh, functions, right? so you can you do get uh, a higher bandwidth the more people share their data for the, mo for the most popular files. So that's another, um, another uh, I would say, oh, this is not really that difficult, but it could be important. Uh, I, I'd say like a pro thing for distributed solution. And I would then by the, high, uh, the hardest part of it all to build tools and infrastructure are people. And I really don't know how to get around it, how to get support for, for, all, the, for all the people to support. Maybe not, ten, not everyone trying to do their own thing, but actually maybe pick a few things and then actually see them through rather than starting 100 things and then seeing them all fail like one after another. And how to achieve that, how to get funding, and how to make things sustainable and maintainable, it's a really big problem and I think we should really all talk more about it rather than uh, just trying to say we should do this thing. Uh, because enthusiasm is great, but then this thing needs to live a little bit longer as well. Okay, I'm done. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Sustainability, hosting hosts, and data storage providers. Okay, so I, we might have to renormalize our chart at this rate because <laughs> uh, <laughs> if, we're, if we're only in that one quadrant, then um, it would be problematic. Uh, any takers for the next up? Let's go. Do you want? I have first the existing tools. First, we, we listed the GPCRM there, which was just uh, mentioned before. And MD sir. Okay, those are existing tools. Uh, and this was the same thing. And then one thing which is quite recent is, is the Google data search. It's a few months I saw it. Uh, so that one at least <coughs> finds our data from Zenon quite well. Uh, so I think that's that's something we we should keep eye on. Uh, and then, of course, we have the NMR Lipids database, which uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure how, how much you have heard about it, but it's it's basically a database which is indexing uh, uh, data, which is almost all in Xenodo now. But it's so the raw data is in Xenodo, but Animalytics database is indexing it. So it's it's basically SQL database and GitHub based uh, indexing of indexing of directories of, of lipid bilayers. Uh, there is roughly 300 tractories there. Uh, they are not all indexed, but that's ongoing. So it's this I would call it an existing tool. It's in nmrlipids.fi is the address if you want to go there. So that's I think that's trying to uh, tackle on the, on the some of the searchability issues of Zenodo and. and it's also an open collaboration which gives credit for the people who contribute. So it's it's a little bit trying to solve that problem. So I will say tomorrow something more about that. Uh, and then related to these existing tools, uh, we discussed about the it's written in meta archive and findability, which we've put extremely important, <laughs> uh, which means that like now we have, now we're starting to have databases. We have animal lipids, we have GPC, RMD, uh, but how do we, like they are searchable, they're both searchable already. They are accessible, but they are not findable in the way that people don't realize that they are there. Uh, and. Uh, and they are not centralized, so they are not in, in, in a single place. But one way to solve this would be the meta archive, which would just link to the data, so somehow combine this. So I, that was one thing which we thought should be done. This is related aggregation and indexing. So, 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 so to make it actually searchable across the different fields, we have to understand how we index them, which kind of keywords we're going to use. Are they going to be molecule names? Are they going to be something else? And which kind of names we should use? Uh, and for, for this one, we thought that we should just start to do this. We should make a prototype of, of, of this met metadata database which would, for example, combine animal lipids and GPC or MD and then we would learn how that would work. Redundancy was somewhere else already. So that's important, of course. Um, compression. I brought this problem is file size compression. I think it's yeah, Eric added random access and file and file compression. Because right. I think it's a way of accessing the database that would be convenient. <coughs> and then we have all automatic feature extraction. Uh, so for in animal limits we have this already a little bit. Uh, I think it's quite important, but it's not that difficult actually because we have the MD trial and this kind of tool. So it's rather easy to write the analysis calls which uh, analyze any kind of data. And I think GPC or MD had that as well. Okay. I think that, did you have something? Yeah, I think we insisted on our table on the fact that. We already have places where we can put the files, and we already have databases that host files or list files. And the problem is to find these databases, query this, and query these databases and these files. We have a bunch of trajectory on the node, but a, a very specific database did annotate them. How do we query this database and expand the search to all the databases that exist already? And also we insisted on how easy it should be to push the data there. And I think it's, uh, it's not there, actually. And I think it's how we started with the automatic feature extraction. It's 
a lot of things are in the files already. They could, we should not have to fill 20 pages of uh, form if it's already in the TPR file. And also on, on how iterative it should be. We, we don't know yet what we need as a keyword, but as we search and as we get used to use that, that, that search object, we get to know what we need to search for and what to add to this automatic annotation or how to manually annotate the thing better. On your side, <coughs> you spent three months running your simulation, spending one hour filling a few forms. It's a small overhead. I think when people deposit a PDB, they are forced to do it. Of course, if you can facilitate it, it's great, but on your side. So we have generic automation right in the middle. That's more like workflow automation? Or? I guess it depends. It can be metadata automation. So once you start a simulation, metadata is automatically extracted. Maybe with some project description as well, because you don't want to necessarily write the project description for all the simulations that you will run there. So Maybe workflows. I think it's a rather general statement. Yeah, there you go. That's an early automation. Yeah, I'm just trying to organize this so that you know, we have less categories. That's why I put it in the middle because I guess it can be easy and it can be. Uh, so, th I so this is more like met um, metadata automation. Yeah, I think that would be the, probably the most, like the first step and mm -hmm. easy to solve the workflows. We also have searchability metadata and meta archive and findability. I feel like that's all kind of the same thing. Should we, which direction should we go in for this? But I, I, I think, I think I've lived in our example there was an argument with findability and searchability are different things. I have, I have a database which is very well searchable, but Eric's opinion was that it's not findable. <laughs> <laughs> because, he, because he doesn't yeah. know about it. Yeah. So, yeah. Once you're there, you can find the trajectory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I would say picture, for example, yeah. is searchable. You can query, yeah. but you can't really find useful information. Maybe it's not so useful. perhaps we just take away searchability yeah. as too generic a term, and then metadata would go underneath us? Well, together, probably with the automated extraction of data that you put in the middle. Yeah, so how would you like these? <laughs> 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 Well, the fact that it's automatic is less important than the fact that it's there. Yeah. yeah. But the automatization is extremely important when it starts to expand. Like when we are expanding to the point that it takes way too much time with our automatization. So I think if you want to really have a good database, it has to be automated. But how many, how many submissions per day do you expect? How many? Because that's, that's why it comes, if you have to spend a lot of time to provide an interface which is automated, but the people are going to submit once every month. But then you have the backlog. But it's also related to yeah. uptake, because yeah. if, if it's going to take me an hour to figure out how to, how to do this thing, yeah, and no one is forcing me to do it, I'm not going to. That happened with the BDB. Once the journal decided you need to have an entry with the PDB ID before you can publish, and people were forced to spend hours visiting, and they did it. Yeah. And now it's being streamlined in some software where you prepare as much as possible. <laughs> so we have roughly one, uh, quickly calculated, we have one submission of one trajectory per every week on average okay. during the first, let's say, five months. <laughs> so, so it's, it's like if you have to use, <coughs> if you have to use like hours for that, yeah. it, it's quite a lot of work. Well, that's awesome. So again, I'm slightly devil's advocate. So the talk of forcing scientists to spend an hour when we're all very, very busy sort of worries me slightly. But obviously I was involved in the biosim lift project. And obviously this was only 10 years ago. But uh, every single trajectory that would have been stored in biosim lift would now be discarded as a collaboration. So I would well, I think in, in the key bit, simple, stupid kind of way of working with things, I'd actually say just targeting the ability to put the input files in, because what was really difficult to generate today is going to be a equilibration in five years' time. So it's the input files, what was run is more important to say than the trajectories and all of those kind of things. Um, our 
Yeah, so we have a lot of documents, so I want to try to go fast, but you might have to help me find stuff. So we had all these, uh, and the surfing share, GPCR MD, the nodo, I guess everybody is aware that they exist at this point. Uh, but there were a few also initiatives that were, I don't know how, if they were altogether abandoned, I guess it's related to the fact that there had been grants at some point and then they stopped. So there's this thing called dynamic dynamics. Dynamics. Uh, dynamics. The one from Valerie Daggett, or is yes, this a different exactly. Yeah, but it's not in, like you can't upload your simulations there. This was just yeah. like a massive database that you can search and use and reanalyze, so but you who, can't upload. So who puts their data there? The Valerie Daggett group. And it's not actually <laughs> So should I just not put it under existing tools? It doesn't. I mean, it it doesn't. It doesn't fit there. I mean, it's still sharing, just not. Yeah, like it's some not that they share the tools. Yeah. So it it's also sharing your own way of sharing. <laughs> there's a. <laughs> um, Along the same lines, I think there's this uh, molecular dynamics extended library model that's from Barcelona. So nobody has mentioned that. There's a uh, here has uh, Mendeley data together with a journal, um, and that provides you a DOI, but uh, <coughs> it's not restricted to anything. It can be um, anything. So the HTML, I don't know who wrote this. That's a uh, similar tool as a user. Okay. So, under this. so these were the existing tools. Um, in terms of features, I think a lot of everything has already been said, but we might have placed them in different places. So we had searchability, which you guys said is too broad. I think we meant, I'm interested in, like you were describing, so I'm interested in this specific ligand, this specific protein, it's been done with that specific technique and that sort of thing. So that was this, no? Uh, oh, this one. So. Like the metadata searchability, yeah. exactly. We had uh, intuitivity, which I think is, uh, we want ease of use. Ease of use, yeah. Where is that? Is that right? Ease of use? Yeah. 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 Sustainability. Uh, this I think we heard also. We've put in concerns, difficulties. Oh, yeah, right. <coughs> But it's an important, we put it under very important. Well, that's yeah, that's it's people, people, doesn't it? It's having somebody who's going to be continuously developing the tool. Right, so it's not really under implementation difficulty, yeah. but yeah. it's yeah. difficult yeah. to yeah. do other things. Uh, quality control is something that was mentioned also by you. Uh, I think this hasn't been mentioned too much already. Yeah, I think that can be used with contributing data in some ways. But it's it's really about how do we trust that it's good quality that we can use and we don't accept any quality like control is also related to metadata automation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a thing which basically killed by Simlip. It was really, really, really hard to do quality control. Yeah. That's very hard. It should be it should be right at the top of like this is <laughs> 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 That was what we spent a month doing that. As you said, like this current simulation would be your collaboration periods like visualization. Yeah, and like publish data for example. You can say, okay, it's published so a journal can know it, so it should have good quality. So you could say only allow published data, for example. Or you can ask your viewers to post. I mean, we're happy to do it. I can think that someone is good quality data, and you can say, no, this is crap. I disagree. Yeah, we're doing this like so we can like say this is like major, 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 specific journal, then it's decided. Yeah, but, it's, but, but, no, but it came down to, we, we were trying to work on what was the equivalent of the, um, of what we any angstrom, 2.5 angstrom, the value for how good a, Mm. Uh, yeah. good as the crystal structure was. Yeah. And ultimately, I can publish a trajectory which has a really unique track and false field, but it's not really shit. Should I be trusting that as much as something that's been run with all the bells and whistles turned on, with eval turned on, and with all of that? And the quality work it's just published is based is just saying somebody else thought it was okay. There's a whole scheme of quality above that, and you might say I want to find all really high quality simulations of these GPCRs that I can trust. In, but that's in impossible to answer. That's yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's why it's a resource field. So you have to accept that. Actually, you know, even if the PDB and all the resolution, and then you can. 
care no you know because yeah. there are other viable solutions you can check you know how much do they deviate actually with simulations yeah. well, you should only accept trajectory that are replicates yeah, because it's a, but that's what I'm just saying. It's not the extremely difficult thing to do. Because right. But it's why really it's not But this is also so what we mean by like protocols. Yeah. That, that you have. So if you have followed this protocol, to some extent you can trust that it's... I think you don't want to have people who are in checking yeah, yet. Because that's, that that becomes the PDB where they have annotators with nothing else than checking entries. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge funding effort. But maybe yeah. there is things yeah. we can agree on because in the they have quality yeah. measures <laughs> in the PDB of structures. So maybe we can say, well, this, you know, it's a whatever thermostat. It's like the anything you shouldn't trust in this. Uh, we had analysis tools. We divided this between advanced and basic because we thought that basic analysis tools are important but not difficult, and advanced analysis tools are not so important and difficult. But, and then this tool is here, so it's nice because we can <laughs> <laughs> uh, Consistent metadata, I'm not sure what that meant anymore. We've talked a lot about <laughs> metadata. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is it automatic? Or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Visualization was in the middle exactly here, so I think that's the I don't think we thought analysis and visualization was the same, though, so... <laughs> <laughs> the lines of uh, licensing, we also thought about identifier of the data, which I think goes to the same. But we thought it was important and not that difficult. I th it's probably something different that we meant. Licensing, I mean, like CCBY, who can use and reuse right, your so data under what conditions. Yeah. Yeah. DOI so is just identifying particular data set. And, you know, but also authorship, data. right? Who, mm -hmm. has, who has done this? Yeah, getting getting credit for it. Yeah, but that's yeah, for that's citations, but right. not for credit. It's just for citations. <coughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> we had interoperability, which is already there, and uh, concerns, costs. How decentralized should it be? We talked about already. Uh, something that hasn't been mentioned, but I was mentioned in GPCRDB, is the types of techniques supported. I think this is actually really kind of crucial, and we haven't talked much about it. So we're moving away or moving away from classical MD, maybe more and more using advanced teams. So what do we do with this? I think that should be a very critical point. Uh, how decentralized? We who said it's not a problem? I mean, you put it where technology, no? Yeah. Output will be higher. It's not that easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not impossible. Yeah. Setting up IPFS returns is not. <laughs> um, this is, is, uh, was about our user base, so depending who you're targeting, actually all of this landscape potentially shifts and that was difficult for us to determine what was important or not important. So do you want this to be useful for... Probably your difficulties. Uh, yeah, so do you want it to be for, the, for me sharing with my colleague or are you trying to bring a student and showing them that this is really cool or is that sort of question? Am I done? Uh, what? That was... Yeah, what kind of data would you upload? So, um, how many replicates, just one representative, all the simulations you made, um, do you strip it, like um, only certain frames of it? Um, so, what exactly? And that was under concern. Uh, exactly, because we, don't, we would have to discuss this to, like... We don't have a consensus. <laughs> yeah. And cost? It was mentioned that we shouldn't worry about it. <laughs> it's not having a concern. I mean, yeah, it's certainly uh, a concern. It's 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 voilà. <laughs> so we have uh, quite a few tools listed, which is great. Um, we have a very complicated uh, diagram here. Uh, what I find really interesting, though, is like, you know, kind of this is sort of the square that you usually focus on at, at the very beginning with these kinds of things. Um, and uh, realistically, a basic analysis tool was the both the simplest and, and the most important. Um, I, I question though, do we already have basic analysis tools yeah. effectively? So we can check this off. Mm -hmm. Stop, it's great. <laughs> um, so we have them, but we want at least one of them to keep being supported. <laughs> and I'd rather with the, the analysis tool, I mean, it, it's linking together the 
So the analysis tool, can you be able to communicate to the trajectory, the trajectory file, the trajectory server, what data it needs? So essentially, the analysis tool, we want to do an RMSD of a protein backbone. And at the moment, the analysis tool is taking the entire trajectory across to the tool. It's then going through all the atoms, throwing 90% of them away, and then getting the protein <coughs> and getting the analysis. If we could couple our basic analysis tools to the trajectory file formats, which can actually have things extracted from them, so subsets of trajectories gain easily, then actually I think we have a very easy, quick win, which is a quick analysis tool. We can then all agree, we'll just put all of our analyses into this one tool. Um, it now seems to be MD analysis, not MD trap, but that's fine. Um, do I identify this? Um, relatively done. If you do something like Zenodo, it will let you get to it. Um, you know, this is more of a question than uh, anything else, but how centralized is this going to be like an IPF task base kind of thing, or like a central repository? Um, getting a central repository of terabytes is pretty easy. Getting a central repository of petabytes or exabytes gets much, much harder um, extraordinarily quickly. So, you know, there's strong arguments for distributed cases. Um, well, I'm strongly for that sort of idea that we each host our own server that we could then use for whatever means that we want. We can either share when publication comes out, and then it's your responsibility, that's your data. Uh, and if it's, if it's good or bad, well, it, it falls on you rather than falling on anybody else, then sharing it, then, then, then worrying about it. Um, it also means that you can share it with people you're collaborating with as well. But yeah. that yeah. also means like you need to have one server where you could like search for all the different files, so you need to link them at least somewhere, oh, somewhere. Sure. And, if you're so, searching like... Yeah, and on that metadata servers, as we commented here, like, you know, that's terabytes of metadata, which is a lot more tenable for a single entity to hold. Um, at the same time, you have to think about um, this particular audience compared to the generic audience. Can you imagine having everyone spinning up their own server to host their own data? <laughs> Um, unless this is mandated by a funding agency. But I mean, I would just like to add that every university should have their repository, like every library has a repository, and just nobody uses them. Well, they're not going to take your gigabytes of data. Because they have no idea what it is. I think it's changing now, and I think libraries are getting more. I mean, I think they're trying to change their role now as well, but it could be, I mean, I think it would be possible to have like servers that are catered by the university, so you can use. That as a solution. Or alternatively, I think you can just go and buy whatever what, what you want to what, put your data on. It's up to you. But you should have the choice, I think. Yeah, I, think how we don't, I think the university libraries are always lagging behind what they are doing, so it's not going to solve the problem. I, I would disagree. Or you put everything Who actually communicates with librarians on a daily basis? Okay. Two hands. Very I give them input when they are designing what they want to do for open data, so I kind of have an idea of where they're working. Yeah. And they are in open air and things like that. They are all, many libraries are in these open air projects for data sharing and all of that, but they are not ready to share this kind of data and this amount of data. Yes, I mean, I've been, um, so I work with them because I work in the advanced computing center and we have the research data storage facility and data stock for us. That's where you can dump data for the university, for the researchers, they can all do this. It can be made publicly visible, but it's a data bucket. We cannot run servers which go through the university firewall, which has custom code doing complex searching. So the only way we can have our own server is effectively just doing a data dump. And the data dump is, here is the trajectory is a big Taji Z. And I think what we're discussing here is that what we want is to move beyond, here are lots of Taji Zs, and more towards actually, this is a searchable thing with its own searching interface. So my concern with everyone spins up a server is Bristol, we definitely wouldn't do that. The only way we'd allow that to run is if it was running in the cloud. We wouldn't let it run in university hardware because it's a punch through the university firewall. And if you run it on the cloud, your data transfer costs are exorbitant, about $100 per terabyte. Exactly, it doesn't solve the problem. What if there was a single robust, uh, agreed upon as secure, well penetration tested piece of software that we could run that ran under very specific circumstances that, that most of our security teams would be happy with. Then it would cost you a ridiculous amount of money to engineer that because basically I do secure software. <coughs> I, I would guess few people in this room actually know how to write secure software. And it's just it's it's really hard and actually doing security analysis 
and then persuading every single university that it's that's the pathway secure enough to actually be on the firewall ledge. That's a huge undertaking. Should this morning one of the likes were that we probably should not care about what bytes are written on disk. <coughs> Isn't the problem here that we should not care about where the file is hosted. We should have an infrastructure that can deal with files regardless of where they're hosted. So you're saying we should encode them all as YouTube videos and then throw them somewhere else? That probably <laughs> but the, you know, the, the question is more, if we have a metadata server, it does not care where the where the uh, <coughs> trajectory is on. The tra you have a URL or DOI to the trajectory, and here it is. And yeah. the hosting is much smaller in any capacity. And if it's, if, if it's agnostic enough of where the files are, it can be at the library of your university, it can be on the node, it can be on the cloud. It does not matter much. I agree, except that all your metadata can do is basically would have to either it goes enough information to find it, but that means you can't actually go into the trajectory, because otherwise you'd have to transfer the trajectory from the university system or Zenodo to the metadata server to do the analysis to go and find the things the users asked for. Or you've encoded enough information that you don't need the original file, but by definition information has the same density, it's the same like size, so once you've got enough information, you can do rigorous searching in the file. You've actually basically transferred the bulk of the trajectory to the metadata server. And so if you have a pure metadata server over five years, about half your links will be broken. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what I mean, would it be possible to have uh, again a service which you as a university are paying for it, to have like this service being spun out for like multiple? I mean, for the entire university, it doesn't sit within the university firewall, so kind of escape this entire thing. This like for a special purpose, right? It can be maintained by the university. I don't think it's that hard if you have your IT people uh, taking care of it rather than like every group has like one person who will like, spin up like a that, That's definitely 100% would not get through IT. No. Because once you're talking about having an IT person look after it, that's expensive. So we do, we do our best to get rid of services that we have to do. Buying a service that would host it, well actually what you described is a centralized service. And so it's much easier to just say, okay, let's set up a cloud service and everyone wants to deposit their data pays £150 to deposit the data. That is so much easier to set up from an organizational point of view than trying to have a, a cloud service that every university could pay for for their own researchers to set put their own data in and that they then have to manage themselves. <coughs> Database. It's now it's such that we, we have we have a basically it's a GitHub repository which has indexed links to the raw data. And when you want to use one of the data sets, you have a script which downloads the data on your on the computer you're using. So the actual database is very light, and it, I don't think it even needs any server. It's it's like it's just a list of links and scripts, and then it really doesn't matter where it gets it. But of course we need we need some places for it to put it on. And now we have ten other but, but that doesn't matter if it's ten or whatever. And I don't think that kind of indexing database needs like specific infrastructure. I know it sounds like a nice discussion, but it sounds like something for the future, thinking about this, setting this up and um, actually like I guess like almost everybody here has it has its own website somehow. And putting there the links of your simulation, putting there your simulation somehow connected to some database, that's not a big issue. That's not a big problem. And that you can do now. And then you come for now back to like having your own database every group, but then you have something at least. Yeah. Instead of like actually. waiting for the next ten years to somebody to set up a global thing. Yeah, and this is like, you know, having little places where we kind of nucleate this. And like once we have large enough nucleation, then you can start tying these together. And yes. Oh. And if we, if we take the web, there's uh, something that nobody uses anymore, but that's the sitemap. It's like, on my server, I have these files <coughs> at this place, and they do that, and they will present that. And if already we had, I know where these simulations are, and in it, uh, it's a simulation run with this, it has these molecules in it, and it runs for that long, then as a user, you find that, and you have to filter afterwards, but you do your own filtering. The filtering gets decentralized. 
And this is something we could do rather quickly. It would be having one file each and not a huge infrastructure. Is, is it easy for uh, everybody to host files that are just, you put in the URL and you get a tarball back? Um, because you know some of these library hosting things, you have to register and then click through and then click a download link, and there's no uniform interface to even just yeah, that's, the, that's the problem, because every university, again, how they have money for that, right? If they build their own repository, which they do, and they are just, uh, the, last year I was at this e-research conference in Australia, and there was this really, really sad uh, presentation from a Monash University. They had this repository, and then they had like these statistics about users, of the, and it like went from, like in percentages, it went to 25%, but it was like uh, four users, and I think three retired, and like, <laughs> but then, <laughs> and everyone uses Dropbox and Google Drive, which is completely not in line with the university's policies. But the problem is that, that nobody really communicates with the libraries. They build these tools for researchers that then they don't really use. And then this again, this is the story that repeats over like, like all the fields, all the tools where people kind of think they are solving the problem, but they don't. So, so to counter the Bristol one, it has about 3,000 users. We charge the users 750 pounds per terabyte, which gives 25 years storage. And actually the, the economy, we set up the economics today, it's been running for 10 years. So the first university in the UK to have a data store, and we worked with the funding councils to make it a requirement to have data stores. And all the researchers use it because it is the cheapest way to get a DOI and to have long-term, high, multi-terabyte storage of data. We host things like the Alsfat Children in the 90s study. All of the data goes on that. It's a massive infrastructure to run it. When you get to that, it's a, like a five, six petabyte data store now. And you can create uh, shared projects. We have uh, ISIS certification, so you can actually do secure projects for their NHS data. These things are built, universities do use them, but they are so difficult to build and have to be so secure that you can't put custom servers on top of them. It's just not possible, so it becomes a data bucket. And you have to go through complicated links to get links to the actual data because of all of this additional infrastructure you have to build to make it work not just for easy data like this, but human data and tissue data and all of the other data. So maybe there would be a market for different types of servers where you put like really data that has like data that have really high privacy implications, like patients' yeah. data. But, but this is the cloud. You, you're there. just describing the cloud. the cloud. And the cloud, you can pay for data stores and. But I mean, the, the, that's what I'm trying to say. It doesn't really matter like whether it's cloud or not. It's uh, it's how you connect it, right? I agree, and it's the it's the cost of things. So if you're doing terabytes, it's relatively easy. But we're beginning now to talk about data. And everyone can run a service and can host a terabyte. It's not difficult. It's when you get to we're having hundreds of terabytes or petabytes. At that level, a petabyte of data is approximately in the cloud £1,900 per month. You know, that's a lot. And it's pulling it off is more than And pulling it off is yeah. quite expensive as well. $10,000 or $10,000 for But I think the storage is not something we're going to solve. So that's, I think, each institution has to solve to have this solution and then. So we're not going to solve that one. We're not going to, to start running an empty database. Uh, but this is why I come back to where is the value in the data? The value is in the analysis you run now. So we need to make it much easier for analysis tools to be pointed at a trajectory file mm -hmm. and actually get the analysis out of it. Now, trajectory files, we can strip data out of it live. So I can just get the protein, or I can just get the water, so I can do get that bit. It's also where we need to say, actually, the trajectory data we generate today, we don't need to keep it for 10 years, because in five years' time, it's easy to regenerate, which again changes the cost model you're working with. And the most important thing to say for the trajectory are the input files, as John said. How did you generate it so we can regenerate it? Accepting the fact that all trajectories are completely stochastic, so we don't even need to perfectly regenerate it, because every time we run, we'll get a different trajectory. Okay. Having data stored somewhere enter an analysis tool is not a problem. It may be an annoyance, but it's not a problem. Uh, recently there was an MD analysis uh, workshop, and to share the example files with the people in the workshop, started a very simple project that creates an MD analysis universe, so the data structure of MD analysis, from file hosted on the node. So, 
at some point it's just having a URL. The difficulty is not the, the difficulty is how do you know where the file is? So that's why again going back to IPFS, that's why it's also an elegant solution because they're now working on content based addressing. Which, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's still very young technology, so I think it's not perfect. They're still solving a lot of problems, but in that way, you don't, in that way, you're probably also solving, not solving, but maybe reducing the problem with the missing links, because if you have the hash in the data, you should be able to find regardless where it is. So you don't have to know where it is, you just have to know what piece of data you need. Link's usually hard because the data is taken down. Like a lot of people post data about, you know, basically guarantees that's going to be up for 10 years. Um, and for example, like a lot of the guarantees are for five years. And uh, we've been talking about this for five years. So since they've been up for the first time, there's some variable that's going to be broken at that time. And also, I think that a link is not enough because, again, if you're doing a workshop and I have a link to for 20 students to download 20, 20 megabyte files, that's totally fine to share that. But if my trajectories are actually five terabytes each, then a link is really awful, and I shouldn't be downloading five, you know, 20 times five terabytes over one. So you should one do the cache it. No, yes. what you should do is move the computing analysis to the data. <coughs> and so if you are going to move towards trying to build services which enable you to, to basically host MD data, it's so critical that the analysis tools actually sit with the data, because you want the students to move the analysis to the data, not to move terabytes of data back to the students. But we have six millisecond data sets for individual proteins, right? Yeah. So we can, you know, it took a good chunk of our cluster to compute on that. We can't offer that to everyone. So the cloud is the only place you can do that kind of computation. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you, this is not easy. This is, again, building an infrastructure like the EBI and things like that. And that's not going to happen here. And that's not going to happen without major investment. Yeah. Because now we are speaking that our trajectories are going to be in all kinds of different university places and repositories. Mm -hmm. There will be no compute associated with those locations. So I think moving the compute to the data for the time being or is not or doing the analysis where the data are, I think is not realistic now. And unless it's in the unless there is a big project that's going to aggregate everything which is close to some supercomputer center. But that's that's not going to happen on any short term, I think. Or the EBI or one of these big things say, yes, we want to host data. Then we can think about it, but now it's that. Yeah. Or everything is on the cloud. But maybe as a more radical short term solution, I mean, uh, just forgetting completely about trajectories and saying, okay, but we would like to have our, uh, talking back at the beginning of this day, an ontology about how we did the simulation, and we want to choose that sim uh, information, and we want to make that searchable, and we want to make at least uh, provided by that I can know that Chris did a simulation on that, that yeah. this and that protein, so I can send you an email, you send me the trajectory, uh, or you send me what you have analyzed. That might be very much more feasible to set forward. Though so this would require what we discussed this morning, like an ontology. Okay, how did you do the simulation, of course? Um, so on that, uh, we have about five minutes left in the session. I was thinking we could move it to two other items to see if they're a bit more tractable. Um, so the first one is a topology that has both biological <coughs> and chemical awareness. John, was that you? Can you elaborate yeah. on that? Yeah. So, um, if you, again, want to know what's in the system, um, there's, like, PV doesn't tell you about what a small molecule might be or what a covalent adduct might be, unless there's also something in the chemical component dictionary, but these are just like a random collection of things. If you just look at the, the PDB file or whatever is in the trajectory, you may not know that there is a, you know, an aromatic ring here or that this is corresponding to a particular uh, ibuprofen molecule or something like that. You can't just match it by the elements and the, the connectivity. These might be a different polymer. So having something that says, you know, the biopolymer is isoform 1A of this protein, residues 27 through 429. Here are these, these are buffer molecules. So here's the smile strings and the mappings of atoms. Um, we've been trying to come up with a standard like this for the open force field project because you need that information to be able to apply force field parameters, especially if you want to generally match anything that says in the small molecule universe. Um, but having a standard, we, we can at least say, here's what I simulated, and here's where the atom, what the atom indices are of the things that are chemical, chemically distinct would be super useful. Does, does anyone know of something that fits the bill already? Or what about that make? chemical ontology developed by Peter Murray Rust? Peter Murray Rust. Yeah, it, it's CML. It's HTML, <coughs> but it's like chemical. 
Yeah, Mark Simon was not going to cover that. Yeah. So Simon was actually dead. That was followed up by CJSON, and actually the QC schema is the third evolution of this, actually. So we. But that, that's not. The previous work. Yeah, QC schema is great for quantum chemistry, but it's not entirely perfect but for molecular chemistry. But it's kind of like ontology based, and we probably could do this. Um, actually, Simon uh, Sima was never ontology based in a lot of ways. <coughs> um, if you want like a true ontology in this, you need to talk to. Um, Chemical semantics in Florida. Um, uh, I do not remember the guy's name, but let me do one search and I can get it to you. But there, there are some standards that people use, uh, like smiles. There's a specification for it. Um, you can tag the atom numbers, and that becomes a smart string that you can then rematch and recover the association of which atom indices are, are which uh, in your file. So we're, we're using those things at the moment. And it's not unique, depending on the it's flavor of the software, you, well, yeah. but you have different smiles that represent the same molecule. If you're going from the molecule to the smiles, then that's not unique. Yeah. Um, we're, we're working on a canonical way to do that as well uh, with, with Daniel, but the other way around, where you have a description of what's in there, and then you have the tagged atoms, that is a unique, chemically unique thing, at least. So the PDB gives you three different smiles for each chemical they have. Yes, yes, because, because they are, those are not. Entirely canonical, yeah. yeah. Um, and so the other one, actually, the other thing that we haven't talked about that uh, within this um, highly important and not as difficult is automated feature extraction. <coughs> actually, seems like a possible goal. So automated feature and metadata extraction. Mm -hmm. I want to it, I think at least something to begin with, and whether it can be better probably, but can we just use I volumes? Yeah. Okay. Um, unless there's any last minute questions, uh, I think we'll have a 15 minute break. Um, and after the 15 minute break, uh, we'll come back and do the next session on. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, streamlining molecular simulation. Thank you, everyone.